into the fountain Deep your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy His deep cries out and a very warm welcome to our service of online worship this week. My name's Russ Gant, I'm the vicar here at St James's Church for those of you who don't know me. And it's great to be able to join with you in your homes or wherever you're uh, viewing this service to be able to come and worship the Lord together. Today is the first Sunday of Lent and so we're starting a new sermon series uh, over these next six weeks, the six Sundays of Lent, thinking about uh, the grace of God and so we're going to be looking at some themes which help us to explore the grace of God. So let's be still at the start of our service as we come before the Lord. Let's just still our hearts at the beginning of a new week and ask God that, that we would meet with him. He's here, he's ready to meet with us wherever we are this morning. And so let's just be still and pray that God would come and would meet with us. Lord God, still our hearts. Prepare our minds to engage with you. Come by your Holy Spirit wherever we are today and fill us afresh with an understanding of your presence with us and your love for us. And as we explore this exciting theme of your grace, your undeserved gift poured upon us. We thank you again that you love us so much that you would come to this world, that you would enter into our lives and that you would come to redeem us, to reconcile us to God, to show us your love. And so as we worship you this morning, we pray that we would encounter you in our lives afresh. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to spend some time worshipping the Lord and I, I imagine you in your homes or offices or wherever you're uh, listening to this service uh, singing out to God as you hear these songs of worship. So let's praise him together. Yeah. 
And so we're going to turn now to our Bible reading, and Judith's going to bring our Bible reading from Luke's Gospel. The reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. I am reading from the Passion Version. Then Jesus said, There was a father who had two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me the share of your estate that belongs to me? So the father went ahead and distributed among the two sons their inheritance. Shortly afterward, the younger son packed up all his belongings and travelled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. With everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry, for there was a severe famine in that land. So he begged the farmer in that country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. The son was so famished, he was willing to even eat the slop given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. Humiliated, the son finally realised what he was doing and he thought, there are many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here? dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop. I want to go back home to my father's house and I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I'll never be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the young son set off for home. From a long distance away, his father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar. And great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. So the father raced out to meet him. He swept him up in his arms, hugged him dearly and kissed him over and over with tender love. Then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be, the father interrupted and said, son, you're home now. Turning to his servants, the father said, quick, bring me my best robe, my very own robe, and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger and bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For this beloved son of mine was once dead, but now he's alive again. Once he was lost, but now he is found. And everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. Now the older son, was working out in the field when his brother returned. And as he approached the house, he heard the music of celebration and dancing. So he called over to one of the servants and said, what's going on? The servant replied, it's your younger brother. He's returned home and your father is throwing a party to celebrate the homecoming. The older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him, come, enjoy the feast with us. The son said, father, listen, how many years have I been working like a slave for you, performing every duty you've asked of a faithful son? 
and I've never once disobeyed you. But you've never thrown a party for me because of my faithfulness. Never once have you even given me a goat that I could feast on and celebrate with my friends like he's doing now. But look at this son of yours. He comes back after wasting your wealth and on prostitutes and reckless living and here you are throwing a great feast to celebrate for him. The father said, my son, you are always with me by my side. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to celebrate like this and be overjoyed because this brother of yours was once dead and gone. But now he is alive and back with us again. He was lost, but now he is found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I'm really excited to be starting this new sermon series as we explore together through Lent, perhaps uh, one of the most beautiful and unique characteristics of what it means to be a Christian. And that is to experience and to know the grace of God. But what, what is the grace of God? Well, we're going to spend the next six weeks, the next six Sundays through Lent and also uh, on the following Thursday evenings, exploring themes linked with experiencing for ourselves the grace of God. So let's pray and then we'll jump straight in. Father God, come to us afresh, we pray. Help us to experience your grace so that it becomes something that we not only uh, can speak about but that we experience in our own lives and we pray that it would bring transformation in Jesus name. Amen. So I wonder what the word grace means to you. It, it might be a word that we perhaps don't use very often. Um, for me it's my oldest daughter's middle name, Annabel Grace. Uh, it's the proper way to address a bishop Good morning, Your Grace, although our bishop is a bit less formal than that. Uh, it's a form of prayer that maybe some of us might say before a meal, we, we, we pray a prayer of grace. If you're a musician, you might know about grace notes, which are notes that are added into a musical score by the composer. Um, and they're not, they're not strictly required, but they kind of add a greater flow or a flourish to the melody. And then Parliament might declare an act of grace by pardoning a criminal. Maybe we learn something more of the meaning of grace by considering the opposite. We might say you're a disgrace. We might mean uh, that we use as a term of contempt. Or if we see no good in someone, we might say that the person has no saving grace. Or we might even associate a well-known person who's somehow discredited themselves. And we might say that they've fallen from grace. And actually, even when it comes to immigration, sometimes the Latin phrase persona non grata is still used to describe someone who's unwelcome or who's prohibited from a country. And it translates as a person without grace. But although some of these meanings might point us in the right direction, to experience the original Christian understanding of God's grace is to receive the most amazing, the most unbelievable gift. In fact, it conveys, I would suggest, the very essence, the, the true heart of the gospel of Jesus. In its simplest terms, grace is receiving a good gift that we don't deserve. Receiving a good gift that we don't deserve. And when we come to a deeper understanding of the grace offered to us by our Heavenly Father, the gift that we don't deserve, it can lead us into an incredible freedom, the likes of which we may never have known before. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2 says, For because of our faith, he, God, has brought us into this place of grace where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God has had in mind for us to be. 
And that's really the aim of this sermon series. It's to help us all to experience God's grace each and every day so that you and I can can experience that freedom and fruitfulness in our own lives. And I would suggest that never has this been more necessary because as I've talked to many of you and as I've experienced for myself at times over these last really challenging months, many of us have expressed a sense of losing uh, security, uh, a sense of uh, a lack of purpose, and also obviously uh, a lack of intimacy with, with others because we're physically separated from loved ones. So my hope is that as we explore this together, we'll realise that grace is something that each of us need because when everything else is stripped away, there must still be something that we can rely on. And it's God's gift of grace given to us. Grace is sadly not often the first characteristic that is associated with the church or with followers of Christ. In the Bible reading we've just heard, we might quite reasonably expect the father figure, who in this parable represents God, to be quite within his rights to respond with anger and condemnation at the way that his son has treated him and to simply expel him from the relationship for good. And because that's how we know that we might respond, we expect God to respond in a similar way. And very sadly, the church too often has been characterised as judgmental and condemnatory, hypocritical and uncaring. And sometimes we have to acknowledge that that characterisation has been entirely accurate. I was once speaking to a chap who explained to me how he was going through a really painful divorce and in the midst of all of that he experienced utter hopelessness. And as part of our conversation I asked him if he'd ever thought about going to a church and his response was really hard for me to hear because he said, why would I go to church? I already feel utterly horrible about my life and surely they would just judge me for my mistakes. What, of course, this young man didn't realise was that people just like him, just like us, who have made mistakes in life, find forgiveness and love and grace in the person of Jesus Christ. The parable of the lost son in Luke chapter 15 actually ends in a way that leaves us and would certainly leave the audience who first heard it in Jesus' day absolutely shocked. Jesus' original audiences probably would have gasped in disgust at the tale of this young son demanding his inheritance right now up front. It's as if he were saying to his father, I wish you were dead. I don't love you, I've never loved you, and I want you out of my life. Now give me my money. And surprisingly, the father gives his son his share of the money. The son takes off to some big city and no doubt has a great time. He probably attracted lots of friends because of the money. He buys all sorts of pleasures and for a short time he enjoys himself. He squanders the money amongst other things on sleeping with prostitutes and the son becomes well and truly lost. What happens when we get lost? Well, Jesus tells us in this story, which of course is part of a bigger parable about other things that get lost. A lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son. When a sheep gets lost, it will often get injured or it might get attacked by predators. It loses its security. When a coin gets lost, despite it still having inherent value, it can't be spent, so it loses its purpose. And when a child gets lost, although relationship might still exist, there's a loss of intimacy. And these, I would suggest, are the top three things that people are struggling with during this pandemic. A lack of security, a lack of purpose and a lack of intimacy. And when the unexpected famine hits, or in our case, the pandemic, this young man resorts to having to eat pig swill. It's all he can find to eat. And the popular interpretation of this Bible passage is that this young man comes to his senses, confesses his sin and returns home as a repentant sinner. That would mean that justice has been done. He's taken the money but realises his mistake, seeks forgiveness and his father shows mercy. But this is not what happens. The son only returns home out of necessity. He's starving and he knows that his father's employees have food to eat. 
And because he expects his father to respond with anger and rejection, he thinks that if he offers to work for his father as a hired hand, he can pay back the money that he's taken. But more importantly, he can get a free meal. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they begin to celebrate. The father responds with so much more than mercy. Mercy offers only forgiveness. The father offers grace, the gift that is so undeserved. The father orders his son to be dressed with the best robe, to have a ring placed on his fingers and sandals on his feet. In having the robe placed on him, the son's security and dignity is restored. The ring is a sign of the father's wealth and power, and by giving him his ring, the son's purpose is restored. And the sandals are a symbol of sonship. Only servants and slaves went barefoot. But the father is saying, you're not a servant, you're not a hired hand, you're my son. And so intimacy is restored. The son that was dead is alive. He was lost, but is now found. But the parable doesn't end there. It should more rightly be called the parable of the two lost sons, because the older brother is just as lost. He's livid that this celebration takes place upon the return of his younger brother. The older brother has always been faithful, always worked on the farm for his father, and yet he now complains that there's never been a party for him. And just as the father went out to meet the younger son, he now goes out to plead with his older son. My son, he says, you've always been with me and everything I have is yours. In effect, he's saying, you're my son. You never had to work or strive for my love or for your inheritance. It was yours always. Do you see what this parable is saying? It's telling us that the grace of God is a free gift. There's nothing that we've done in the past that means we can't receive this grace, but there's also nothing we can do in the here and now to try and earn it. When we realise this, it brings us such freedom. The number of people that I meet who say something like, well, I try to live a good Christian life, and I want to plead with them and say, stop trying. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you more and there's nothing that you can do to make him love you less. In Christ, you and I are perfectly loved and accepted for who we are, not for what we do or don't do. And that, friends, is the very nature of grace. It can't be earned, it's totally undeserved, but it is lavishly bestowed. So whether you think you're a saint or you know you're a sinner, why not imagine, perhaps for the first time, God the Father running to greet you, with arms open wide to embrace you. The man on the train sat with his head in his hands looking completely lost. When I asked him if he was all right, that was when the whole story came out. It was like the floodgates of his soul had suddenly and uncontrollably been opened. His name was Martinez. He'd grown up on a farm with his father in a small village outside Fort Worth, Texas. But in his teens, he got in with the wrong crowd and it wasn't long before he moved from using drugs to selling them as part of a gang. Soon Martinez became one of the gang's most profitable pushers and he sometimes had more money than he could spend. When his father found out about the gang, he pleaded with his son to go back to college but Martinez refused. Not long afterwards, he left home and went to live in San Antonio. Nights often blurred with the days as drugs and alcohol fueled his party lifestyle. 
but one night Martinez was caught by the police in the middle of a deal. There was no hearing, no court case, he simply found himself in jail, sentenced to four years in prison. He gradually realised that he had nothing left. He had no money and nothing to use to bargain with the other inmates. The first time he allowed his body to be used by one of the other prisoners for sex, it didn't seem worth the pain for the two cigarettes that it got him. But the more he did it, the easier it became to turn his mind off. When he eventually left prison, he sent a letter to his father explaining everything that had happened. In the letter he said, I'm so ashamed of all that I've done and who I've become. If you're willing to see me again, will you tie a white ribbon on the branch of the tree by the train station in town? I'll be coming back by train. If I see a ribbon, then I'll know at least you're willing to talk. As Martinez poured out his story to me, I saw how his life could so easily have been mine. I'd made mistakes along the way. Then he turned to me again. I can't bear to look, he said. When we get to the station, will you tell me if there's a ribbon tied to the tree? I agreed that I would. Moments later, as the train slowed for the platform, I peered out of the window, and that's when I saw it. I think you better look, I said to Martinez. As the train pulled into the station, his eyes filled with tears. There, alongside the station fence, was the tree, and it was covered in white ribbons. And an elderly man with tear-stained face was dancing up and down the platform, waving a white ribbon. Father God, we cannot comprehend your unmerited love for us. We cannot comprehend the grace that you desire to pour into our lives. Over these next few weeks, Lord, would you deepen our faith? Would you open our hearts to understand the grace of God. May we know your forgiveness, may we know your mercy, but may we most of all know your grace. In Jesus' name, Amen. Soon 
to reflect on what we've heard as we continue to encounter God this morning. We're going to speak to him now in prayer and Ben's going to lead our intercessions this week. Let us bring our prayers to God, confident that he accepts us in all our weaknesses. God has not promised that we will not see joy without sorrow, peace without pain, God has not told us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. But God has promised strength for each day, his light for our way, and his grace for our trials. We pray for our nation and for all leaders in politics, education and health care, both locally and nationally. We pray that they will have courage, strength and wisdom, that they may seek to do what is righteous in your sight and make decisions that are best for all our people. We pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, and for Justin, our Archbishop. And as they lead our people through this time of Lent, we pray for Andrew and Joe, our bishops. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our young people and teenagers whose education and social contacts are so severely disrupted. We ask your blessing on those for whom everyday life is difficult and for those who are isolating at home. We pray for those who are concerned about loved ones that they cannot visit, and for those who have employment or financial concerns, and for those who use our food bank. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing, we pray for all those who are unwell in body, mind or spirit. We give thanks to you for all those who seek to relieve them by giving of themselves and their time. We have been especially asked to pray this week for Ros Parker, who is awaiting further cancer surgery. For Oliver, Emily and Anna, teenagers of a member of our congregation. For John and Heather Lewis, relations of a member of our congregation. 
all of these people whom are suffering from COVID. We ask for your blessing on Anne Blackman as she recovers from the slip on the ice and for Russ Gant as he recovers from hurting his ankle at home. We pray for Judy's sister Catherine and her husband Keith who are at home with dementia and depression that they will accept the care that is being offered. We hold before God those who have been recently bereaved and ask for God's comfort for them, especially for Ian Webb and his family, as they mourn the death of his father John Webb. And for Caroline Elliott and her family, as they mourn the death of her son Angus Petrie. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lastly, a prayer for ourselves as we seek to share Christ's love with each other and our families, with our village, with our schools and students, and with the wider community. It is your love, O God, that has called us to worship you today, for all our love finds its source in you, the perfect love that casts out fear. Each of us can think about someone we know who needs our prayers. Please pray for God's blessing on them now, silently in your hearts at home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing
Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. It's really difficult for us to not be able to gather together in the church here in Rowledge, but one of the great blessings is that we can reach out to people who perhaps wouldn't normally be able to come to the church here. And so if that's you, we just uh, pray that you uh, are on our hearts and in our minds, that we pray for you, even if we don't know your names, uh, and we pray that you would know God's love for you this week. So let me pray God's blessing over each of us. As we go into a new week, Lord God, we pray that we would know your blessing upon us, that we would know your presence in our lives, and as that we encounter your grace afresh, that you would make us grace-filled people, that as others meet with us this week, they would see a difference in our lives as we seek to pass on the gift of grace that's been given to us. And so I pray that you would know the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit with you and with those whom you love now and forever. Amen. Go in peace into this new week in the name of Christ. Amen.